Questions to the Prime Minister. David Simpson. Question one, please, Mr Speaker. M Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in the House, I shall have further such meetings later today. David Simpson. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. As we prepare to hear the Chancellor's budget today, can the Prime Minister detail for us what sort of an impact scrapping the Barnet formula would have upon the least well-off regions of the United Kingdom, uh, including, of course, Northern Ireland? And will the Prime Minister resolve that those areas, such as Northern Ireland, will not be penalised in terms of the allocation of funding for essential services in the budget? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it has uh, been common ground uh, between all the parties over the last uh, 30 and more years that the allocation of public spending resources in the United Kingdom are based on need. And I believe that that is the right formula and that is the right way to proceed. I can tell them that over the last few months, as a result particularly of the pre-budget report, an injection of resources into Northern Ireland has amounted to £600 million so that the Northern, Northern, Ireland, recover, uh, Northern Ireland economy can do better. And I can also tell him that he has made his representations about the need uh, for uh, extra policing costs as a result of recent terrorist incidents. Uh, and I hope he can look forward to the statement that will be made by the Chancellor later today. Derek Twig. Speaker, the Home Secretary said on Sunday she is committed to releasing any relevant information into the public domain as soon as possible, which shed light on the Hillsborough disaster and its aftermath. Now, my uh, right honourable friend would have seen the distress and anger that still exists uh, in Liverpool and elsewhere and among families and supporters by watching last week's memorial service, where over 30,000 people attended. Can I ask my right honourable friend to ensure that all information is got out as soon as possible, and that should include, of course, not just police files, but health files, local government files, and government papers which relate to the disaster, because it was a disgrace the way it was handled originally, that the police tried to cover it up and present it as, a, as being caused by Liverpool fans, and of course the disgraceful cut-off point at 3.15 for the time of death. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm sure the whole House are on its return will wish to repeat the sympathies that have been sent to all those families who lost uh, loved ones as a result of the tragedy at Hillsborough. Ninety-six uh, people lost their lives on that day, uh, and the inquiry found that actions had to be taken so that something like this would never happen again. And I well understand that even after all these years, uh, the feelings of the families are such that they want to be sure that everything possible was done. And so, yes, we will look at how we can release uh, whatever information uh, is available uh, to the families. I have to say that the Taylor report was a very full inquiry. There was then a further inquiry after 1997 to look into what uh, it may be necessary to do in addition. Uh, but if this is a means by which we can help uh, the families in difficult uh, times, even after these uh, years, uh, we will look very carefully at what we can do. David Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today's unemployment figures are a reminder of the human tragedy of this recession. Young people leaving school and university unable to get a job, families facing tight budgets as people go on to part-time work or lose their jobs altogether. Before we hear the budget from the Chancellor, I want to use this opportunity to get the Prime Minister to confirm some simple facts about the state of our economy. First, will he confirm that today's unemployment figures show that what we've seen so far this calendar year is the fastest increase in unemployment in our history? And that's exactly why we're taking all the action that we're doing. Unemployment, it, unemployment is rising. Order. Do you let the Prime Minister speak? He's entitled to speak. Prime Minister. Order. Don't tell him what to say. The Prime Minister. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Mr Speaker, there are still 29 million people in work, nearly 3 million more than there were 10 years ago. We will continue to do everything we can to help people into work and help people stay in their jobs. That is why we have extended tax credits so that they can help people on short time have a living income. That is why we have taken action to have 35,000 more apprentices in our country. That is why this week we introduced a scheme to help people who are six months unemployed get back into work. That is why we are prepared to spend the money and invest it where it is necessary to do so. 
there is not much point in the Conservatives coming and telling us that they want to do something about unemployment if they oppose every measure we're taking to deal with it. The fact is his schemes aren't working. The, the forecast the forecast the Chancellor made in the pre-budget report for the level of unemployment at the end of the year was reached this morning in April. That's the truth about these figures. So in terms of the figures, will he confirm there are now more young people, not in employment, not in education and not in training, than ever before? Can he give us the figures for that? Mr Speaker, I've looked at this uh, very carefully, actually, and there are... And there are and there are nearly a million more young people in education or training or in work than in 1997. Look at the figures for 18 to 24 or 16 to 24, and the figure is nearly a million more young people are in work or training. Talk about massaging the figures. I asked him. I asked him. I asked him a very simple fact. A very simple fact. How many young people are out of employment, education and training? Answer. And the answer is 857,000. That is the highest number on record. That is, even before the recession began, it was higher than when Labour came to power. If he won't even acknowledge these facts, how on earth are we going to make any progress? Yeah. Let, me, let me turn to the public finances. Will the Prime Minister confirm that next year Britain is going to borrow more than at any moment in our peacetime history? Yes or no? Mr Speaker, first of all, on unemployment and young people, let me just give him the figures so he's absolutely clear. Compared to 1997, when there were 3.9 18 to 24 year olds working or engaged in full time education, the figure is now 4.7 million. And compared to 1997, when there were 5.2 million 16 to 24 year olds in full time education or employment, the figure is 6.1 million. Now, I am giving them the facts, and these are the facts. There are more people in work and in training or education than there were in 1997, and I challenge him to deny that fact. Now, the second, the second thing is uh, public, public borrowing. In every country, borrow is, borrowing is rising. He will find that borrowing is actually higher in America than it is in Britain. And the reason is, the reason is that having lost substantial revenues as a result of the economic uh, crisis, we are still prepared to take the action that is necessary to help homeowners and to help people into jobs and to help businesses. Once again, the question is, will the opposition stop deciding to cut public expenditure at a time when it's most needed? And will they support us when we give real help to people now? Yeah. What we've heard is a complete failure to address the facts. Yeah. When, when he was in... When he was in opposition, he talked about youth unemployment, not the number of people in jobs. The fact is, since they came to power, unemployment is now up and youth unemployment is up. He talks about the deficit. The Chancellor is about to stand up and, I believe, say that we're going to borrow around 11 per cent of our GDP. There's no other country in the G20 with figures as bad as that. If we don't have a Prime Minister who can accept the facts, we're never going to make any progress. Let me try, let me try another fact. In terms of the recession, in terms of the recession, will the Prime Minister confirm that far from being not as bad as the 80s or not as bad as the 90s, we are now in Britain in the deepest recession since the Second World War? Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm glad he's asked that question because in the early 1990s, interest rates went up to 15 per cent. In the early 1990s, inflation went up to 10 per cent. In the early 1990s, they did nothing when people were worried about their mortgages. In the 1990s, they did nothing when people became unemployed. And who was the chief economic adviser to the Chancellor of the time? None other than the leader of the opposition. Perhaps, perhaps on another occasion we can, perhaps on another occasion we can talk about some of your chief advisers and what they've been up to. It's about time this Prime Minister realised, as well as bringing the country to the brink of financial bankruptcy, he brought his party to moral bankruptcy as well. Now, the truth is, 
The truth is we're going to look at the facts. This is the most deep and painful recession since the war. And on that day, and on a day when the Chancellor is going to have to explain that unemployment is rising faster than ever before, that the number of young people not in education, employment and training is higher than ever before, that Britain is borrowing more than ever before, and the recession is as deep as I said, on this day, on this day, will he finally admit he did not abolish boom and bust? Mr Speaker, every, every crisis that has, been, that has happened since the Second World War has been the result of high inflation, pushing interest rates up, causing businesses to go bust and forcing people to get unemployed. That has been the traditional economic crisis we faced. This is a crisis that is happening even when inflation is low and interest rates are low. Mr Speaker, if you don't want to understand the solution, you don't even understand the problem they sent to. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is a global banking crisis that we are dealing with by measures that in every case the Conservative Party have opposed. If they want to do something about the economic crisis, they should support the measures that we've been taking. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On this day of all days, on this day of judgment, let me just have one, one more go. When the whole country can see that we had a boom and we are now in such a deep bust, what is it about the Prime Minister that he cannot admit what everybody knows he didn't end boom and bust? Mr Speaker, he, he, knows, he knows perfectly well that we are dealing with a banking crisis that has infected the rest of the economy. And if the Conservative Party don't face up to that, they will never be able to solve the problem. And I am not going to go to back to the days of the 1990s. Order, order. It's getting to the stage every day, Mr Gray. I've got to tell you to be quiet when a minister is replying to this House. And you've got to pack it in. You've got to pack it in. Prime Minister. Uh, and Mr Speaker, we are not going to go back to the days of the 1990s of 15 per cent interest rates, when we did little to help people with mortgages. This week we've announced a mortgage rescue scheme that will help as our other measures will help thousands of families in the country, this week we have announced measures to help young people who are unemployed. The Chancellor will be announcing measures that will help not only jobs but help build for the future. But to do that, Mr Speaker, you have got to invest in the future. You cannot cut your way out of this recession, and that is the difference between the two parties. The Labour government, contrary to what may have been suggested uh, at the weekend, has done much for the people of Halifax yeah. over the last yeah. year. And the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister is responsible for many of those successes. successes. Therefore, can I ask him to reassure me he will continue to do all he can to protect jobs in the finance industry which thousands of my constituents are employed in. Yeah. M Mr Speaker, there are better schools, there are more hospitals, there are more sure star centres for young people, and there is better provision for the elderly. And that is only possible as a result of, in Halifax and elsewhere, the doubling of public investment in our future. And I have to remind people, I have to remind people, that could not have happened if we had not made the decision to invest rather than to cut our way through the economy. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mr Speaker, over the last few months, the Prime Minister has come up with a shopping list of announcements about creating new jobs. He was up to it again this morning. 100,000 new jobs from big capital projects, 500,000 people in work by paying employers, 400,000 new jobs. He announced new green jobs. That is, that is a, million, a million new jobs that he is now promising, jobs that people desperately need when unemployment is now soaring way beyond the worst predictions. Will he tell the 2.1 million people who are now jobless exactly how many of his new jobs have been created so far? Yeah. Mr Speaker, we believe, as a result of the action that we have taken, hundreds of thousands of jobs which could have been lost are not being lost. And, and I, I, I ask him... I ask, him, I ask him to wait for the Chancellor, who will give him a figure that is very precise when he gives his budget a few minutes from now. And as for action on employment, when he lists the various things that we have done, he is making our point. 
This does not happen by accident. It does not happen by chance. It is because we have taken action to create jobs that more people have not lost their jobs as in other countries. So shows exactly what the problem is. What's the point of his mortgage support scheme that he just referred to earlier for the jobless when he can't even get the banks to join in? How many jobs you, is he going to create from a subsidy, from a subsidy for cars that haven't even been invented yet? These are meaningless. These are meaningless headlines which serve as a health warning for the budget. Because this is a prime minister who makes promises but doesn't deliver, raises hopes without giving real help. Just come clean. He promised a million new jobs. Do they exist today, yes or no? Mr Speaker, first, first of all, the Home Owners and Protection Scheme. I just have to correct him that many companies have joined that scheme and many companies are now agreeing to do similar schemes to the government scheme. So the idea that we have not acted on this is wrong. First of all, there is protection for people who become unemployed at a far higher level than ever before. Secondly, we have agreed with the building societies and banks a moratorium on mortgage uh, uh, repossessions. Thirdly, we have changed the rules that govern court actions so it is a last resort. And fourthly, we have underpinned some of the major building societies so that they can keep people in their homes and they will not suffer the fate of what happened in the last recession. And as far as jobs are concerned, I ask him, both on green technologies and cars, and, and on employment generally, to await the Chancellor's remarks, and I believe that he will answer many of the questions that he has put. Thank you, Billy. Following the uh, success at the G20 in recapitalising re the IMF, will my right honourable friend tell me what plans our government has for the spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank? to protect poor people in poor countries from the uh, global recession? Mr Speaker, we did agree at the uh, meetings of the IMF and World Bank uh, that uh, there would be more action taken to help the poorest of the world. The President of the World Bank has proposed a vulnerability fund. We have said at the G20 meeting that $50 billion more will be available. That is to help restructure the banks in some of the developing countries. It is also to help people with food and education and health. And I've said before that this is not the time to walk away from our responsibilities to the poor of the world. Simon Hughes. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has taken a personal interest in Sri Lanka, where yesterday the Red Cross described the position as catastrophic and where tens of thousands of Tamils have died in the last uh, 25 years. Can he give the House an assurance? that in the days ahead he will put on the agenda of the Commonwealth, the UN and the European Union Foreign Ministers meeting on Monday proposals that might bring a ceasefire immediately and allow not just the relief but independent monitoring of what is going on so that the bereavement, the death, the injury and the homelessness of those poor people can end before there are any more victims. Mr Speaker, uh, there are many members of this House who are very concerned and dismayed by events in Sri Lanka. And I and the Foreign Secretary are doing what we can to press on the Sri Lankan Government the need not only for humanitarian aid now, but the need to press forward with a political settlement which is the only way forward to deal with the problems that we have faced. I spoke to the President of Sri Lanka uh, earlier this week. Uh, I followed up uh, meetings that we have had uh, previously. I asked him to extend the pause on the ceasefire. I also asked him for humanitarian access uh, to those refugees who have come out and uh, are in difficulty and need help, and that the UN should have full access to do so. Uh, and I also asked him if he would receive a delegation uh, from the United Kingdom uh, so that we could uh, ass assess what humanitarian help was available and should be made available. Uh, we have had further discussions over the last uh, few days, and I believe that uh, the President will be prepared now to accept uh, a humanitarian delegation on a cross-party basis uh, from the United Kingdom to prepare the way a, a, a DFID minister will go to Sri Lanka later this week. We will press on the Government the need for humanitarian help, but we will also press on them the need for a ceasefire and the need for a political solution to these problems. Martin Linton. Uh, Mr Speaker, this uh, government has consistently called for an investigation into allegations of war crimes by all combatants in the Gaza conflict. 
Since Israel has now announced that it will not cooperate with uh, an inquiry by the Human Rights Council of the UN, and since nobody is going to be satisfied with an inquiry by the Israeli Defence Force alone, will the Prime Minister support calls for an independent inquiry backed by the full authority of the United Nations Security Council so that we can learn the truth of what happened in Gaza? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, it, we, we did press the Israeli government to fully investigate the allegations made against Israeli uh, forces. Uh, the previous Prime Minister, Olmert, agreed that this would be done. Uh, I have offered the UN Secretary-General full support in his call for an inquiry into the shelling of UN premises in Gaza. All allegations of war crimes must be properly investigated. In addition, I think it is important to say that 50 million of humanitarian aid is now going to Gaza as a result of decisions that the Secretary of State for International Development has made. And I think people will be uh, heartened by the fact that the President of America has asked the President uh, of the Palestinian uh, 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 organization and the Prime Minister of Israel uh, to visit him in Washington to discuss uh, matters of peace over the next few weeks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the Prime Minister like to take this opportunity to apologize to me for what happened? Yes, and I have said sorry that this has happened, and I've also said I've also written to her personally, and I think I think at the, sa at the same time we should we should all say that what happened has no part to play in the politics of this country. It is wholly inappropriate and unacceptable, and that's why there'll be new rules and procedures to govern the behaviour of political advisers. Dr. McDonald. Dr. McDonnell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. What, what com comfort could the Prime Minister give my constituents who work, who work for the Ford appendage called Vistian? And they have been made redundant. There has been a contrived administration reached where basically pensions, people are thrown out of jobs and pensions have been lost. And the sa same has taken place with other constituents in Nortel where similarly a contrived redundancy situation has been created. Mr Speaker, the, 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 car, the, car, the car industry and its components industry is important to this uh, country. There are meetings taking place with the companies uh, concerned. We are doing everything we can to help the car industry through this difficult period, and I would be happy to meet him to discuss these, uh, these particular problems. It is uh, true that Luton uh, uh, won the, uh, the, the final, and I'm very uh, pleased that that has happened. And I think Luton will be back in the league very soon as a result of the efforts that have been made by good local people. As far as housing is concerned, we will invest in helping people avoid repossessions. That is what this government is about, helping people in times of need. But you've got to make a decision to invest to be able to do so. And that is our decision, to invest, not to cut. Greg Mulholland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Apart from sidelining again this House, can I ask the Prime Minister to take this opportunity to explain why on earth he is proposing 
Instead of a system where allowances are based on actual receipts and need, we're going towards uh, a system of daily allowances, which frankly uh, is another example of where the public would believe it snouts in the trough. People will be claiming money for absolutely nothing. Is not the real reason that he's brought forward these rushed and ill thought through proposals because he doesn't have the courage to sack ministers who have been abusing the system. Yeah. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, this is, uh, this is a decision for the House itself. The one thing that is absolutely clear. The one thing that's absolutely clear. The one thing that is absolutely. The one thing that is absolutely clear is that the present system does not work. The one thing that is absolutely clear is that the present system needs to be changed. And the one thing that is clear is that action has got to be taken immediately. If other people have better proposals, let them put them forward. But we are putting forward proposals that deal with this problem and deal with it now. Michael Clapham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will be aware that recently the Information Commissioner found concrete evidence that uh, the, the blacklisting was widespread in the, in the uh, construction industry. Uh, given that there was uh, a consultation exercise in 2003, does he agree that it is now time to actually bring in the regulations to prohibit blacklisting rather than and before going to a further consultation? Yes, yes. M M Mr Speaker, I am, uh, as is the whole government, very concerned about the evidence that has been uncovered by the Information Commissioner about the re-emergence of blacklisting in the construction industry. In 1999, we established a power to introduce regulations to outlaw blacklisting. Uh, we also consulted on draft regulations in 2003. Evidence at that time suggested that blacklisting had been eradicated. Given that there is new evidence that that is not the case, we are looking urgently at what we can do and we will assess whether the 2003 regulations amended as necessary should now be introduced to the House of Commons. Paul Rowan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. At the conf Easter conferences, uh, two teachers' unions passed motions expressing concern about the presence and safety of asbestos in schools. Would the Prime Minister be prepared to meet me and a delegation of those unions to discuss how those concerns might be allayed? As asbestos is a, a killer disease. It is something that we are trying to eradicate in this country. I'd be very happy to meet the delegation that you suggest. Jeff Innes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Is the Prime Minister aware that the main Barnsley College campus building has recently been demolished ahead of a £50 million redevelopment scheme which has currently been put on hold? Um, the Learning and Skills Council had also recently sanctioned the College borrowing £10 million in advance of the project going ahead. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet with me and my other two Barsley colleagues, along with the College Principal Colin Booth, to discuss this issue as a matter of serious urgency? Yes, yes I will. And I, I hope that we can uh, deal with the legitimate concerns of him and his uh, Barnsley College uh, uh, staff uh, about how we can uh, enhance the investments available to further education colleges. I have said before that further education colleges uh, have got more money this year for new investment. Uh, there is a great demand uh, for it. The Chancellor has been looking at it uh, and obviously he will report in due course about what he can do. But I fully sympathise with the points that he has made uh, from the position of Barnsley College. Angus McNeil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister has said you can't cut your way to a recession. Why is he foisting billions of cuts on Scotland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, we are not. Scotland has received two billion more as a result of the injection of money into the economy, both from the rise in pension and child benefits, the cut in VAT, the rise in tax allowances. All that money, two billion in total, has gone to Scotland. And if he does not understand that that is what is happening, he's living in the dream world of the SNP. Yeah. Yeah. Bye, well, my, my right hon. Friend join me in congratulating my local authority, Greenwich Council. It has uh, frozen its council tax for the fifth time in the last 11 years. It has frozen most of its charges. It is providing free swimming for pensioners and under-16s. It is providing funding so that pensioners and disabled people can use London transport at all times. Is not this an example of fairness and efficiency from Labour during these difficult times? 
Mr Speaker, our duty to people in these difficult times is to invest in the future and not uh, cut. Our duty is to be fair to other people and not be unfair. It's all very well the Conservatives shouting if for half the time in question times they're doing nothing and not even standing up to ask questions. I think they are proving that some of them are part-time members of this House. Chairman of Ways and Means.